everyone, welcome back to the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast with Mike Tagliere and I'm Bobby Sylvester. It may be championship week for season-long leagues, but we've actually got several more DFS episodes in store for you through the playoffs. Tags, how do you like this slate? Uh, it's fun, man. I mean, it, it stinks that we have two uh, two Saturday games and we have two Monday night games, so it shortens the slate a bit. We have 12 games, uh, but I feel like there's it, it's tight on DraftKings. Now, I know that you do a lot more FanDuel, and I'm not sure what our guest does more of, but in DraftKings, it's it's really tight this week. I feel like there's not too much value on the board, uh, but it this is the this is the type of week where you really must pay attention and like get down to it because you have to find those value plays in order to pay up for some of the players that we want to. So um, it's it's very tight this week though it's not like a loose week i think our guest does like every site and just wins a ton <laughs> on all of them our guest today is justin mcmahon of daily fantasy com. justin would you say that's accurate dude i definitely focus more on uh, fantasy draft and DraftKings because i like full ppr and i like the three point bonuses for 100 yard mark i didn't like it when i first started playing but i've now realized that it actually benefits players who do good research because it makes touchdowns yes. worth a little less Yes, thank you. I've been I've been saying this for a long time that that PPR, while it does have its its downside, it's more predictive. It's a lot more predictive. And if you do your research, I feel like it's better. And that's why I've always played better on DraftKings, which is why obviously I stuck to DraftKings. Yeah, yeah, right. I think that's totally fair. I mean, the point you guys are making makes a lot of sense. Uh, I enjoy them both. I play them both, but uh, I spend a little bit more on on FanDuel, invest a little bit more, not spend a little bit more. So we've got a really good slate today. Like We've got players at every position, like a handful of them that I like. Um, So we're going to get into it in just a minute. But before we begin, I want to let you all know that DraftKings is putting a really cool contest up for us. Half of everyone wins money, and the winner gets a lifetime subscription to Fantasy Pros and a thousand bucks. If you want to enter, it's just one buck. Ooh. All you have to do is go to fantasypros.com slash DraftKings, and uh, I'll see you there. I'm going to compete against you, and uh, hopefully I'm going to win the thousand bucks. <laughs> I already drafted my team, so if I win, I mean, I'll take the thousand bucks, but I'll give someone else my lifetime subscription because I'm going to have that anyways. I'm joining the contest right now, so neither of you are winning. <laughs> <laughs> that really sucks. I should it. not have mentioned that until like Justin was off the show because he really <laughs> will win. He'll enter one lineup and he will clean up. <laughs> so every Everyone listening, I'm sorry. I am under the weather. My voice is not ideal, Uh, but we're going to try to get through this. It is week 16 and got to get you guys your information. So let's start at quarterback. We're going to go position by position like we always do, and we're going to go cash games first. So at quarterback here, I'm looking at Cam Newton. Tags what you talked about last week, how consistent he is. He continues to get it done on the ground. He's going to get it done through the air against Tampa. As long as he goes, he's got the questionable tag. But I think he's the top quarterback on the slate regardless of price. And he's pretty cheap, too. I definitely like Cam Newton. I'm interested in Justin's take on this because I, I like Newton a lot. But the issue is that it is a division game. They should be able to run all over the Bucks, And I'm worried that Cam's ceiling may not be as high as the player I'm going to play. And that's Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson, a lot of people are, are going to shy away from him after last week. I'm not one of those people. You know, before last week's debacle against the Rams, which, again, it was a divisional matchup. Those are typically closer than people want to think they are. Uh, quarterbacks don't perform usually as well in those matchups either. And Russell Wilson has displayed that twice against the Rams this year. But going to play against a Dallas team that is starting three rookies in their secondary, I want him. I want to pair him with Doug Baldwin in cash. I, I just going up 200. I feel like you get a similar floor with Cam Newton and Russell Wilson, but I think you get a bigger ceiling with Russell Wilson in this game. Justin, what are you doing? Like if you're paying up a quarterback? So I actually prefer Cam Newton. I'm with Bobby on this, and I think the big reason that I prefer Newton is because Wilson has not had more than seven rushing attempts uh, in six straight weeks. And if you look at Newton, he's really ramping up his rushing attempts. And as the games go on and he needs to win more, he ran 14 times last week. He ran 11 times the week before that, um, six times the week before that, nine the week before that. And if you look at the beginning of the season, he was rushing six, five, three for like 16 yards. He had a couple games with zero yards. He's had over 40 rushing yards in like eight of his last nine games, over 50 in most of them. I think the rushing component is what I'm really in it for. I, I'm dry, I'm taking Newton over Ball, um, over Wilson, sorry, because I just think he'll run a lot. And even though they are big favorites, Cam has said he plays better when he runs. They're making a playoff push. I think he's going to be running right out of the gate. Um, so I, I think that his upside is, is so high because he hasn't actually been getting the rushing touchdowns. Uh, which I think is kind of fluky. I would expect him to go back to scoring in the red zone. Yeah, no, I, I and for the record, I want to state that Cam Newton is not a bad play. I have no issue of playing either of them. I like Wilson just because, I, like I said, I feel the ceiling's a little bit higher just because his 
passing ability and Russell can obviously run the ball. But yeah, Cam, his floor is second to none. And that's the thing this week, Bobby, when going through the quarterbacks, like I'm going to we're going to obviously go through some other quarterbacks we like. But I feel like every quarterback I like is six thousand to seven thousand on DraftKings. Yep. I don't want to go cheap. I don't want to I don't want to go cheap at the quarterback this week. And that's the thing is like when you're talking about a difference between Jared Goff at sixty one hundred, you know, Matt Stafford at sixty two hundred and then Cam or Russell Wilson at sixty eight, seven thousand, like pay up because like it, it's a it's a couple hundred dollars. You might as well take the same safety of Wilson and Newton who come with ultra high floors. So neither of you guys talked about Tom Brady and he's sitting there. I mean, I know he's been struggling a little bit lately, but he's still Tom Brady and he's cheaper than Russell Wilson. Is he on your radar at all, Justin? Like, would you consider him for cash games? He's not in our header uh, for our, for DFI university. We have our war rooms um, and in our header of the war room, we have our favorite picks and our quarterback spot. We do not have Tom Brady. Um, it's just the toughest thing about Brady uh, is that it's very hard to pair him with anybody other than Gronk. And mm-hmm. we we like Gronk. He, he is in our header. But we really like Deion Lewis. And it's, it's tough to like Brady, Gronk, and Deion Lewis. The Patriots of today just aren't dropping 40, 50 points on people lately. Um, and so I'd rather pay up for a different quarterback um, and, and trust that Deion Lewis will take the goal line work. Brady is just not getting the touchdowns uh, like like you would want your top quarterback to get. You know, I'm kind of on the opposite end as you this week. Like, I don't mind getting a quarterback running back tight end in a cash game. They're the highest implied total of any team at 29 on the week. And if Tom Brady has a game where he gets one touchdown, well, that means Deion Lewis has like two touchdowns, right? So I don't mind getting exposure to all three and just, you know, letting the three, four touchdowns fall where they fall. Yeah, but with the Patriots, it doesn't necessarily always mean that you're getting Deion Lewis touchdowns. You could be getting James White touchdowns. You Gillis could be Lee. getting Gillisley <laughs> random players that you didn't even know were on the team. Yeah. So, I mean, Brady's last three weeks, he's had 16, 11, and 9. All of those, I think, kill you in cash games if you're paying 6900 especially when all three of those games are lowest than the lowest game Cam Newton has had in, like, six weeks. So, I, I don't know. I, I think it's a little risky to go with Brady. I, I'm very risk-averse in cash games that I think everybody tries to be. Uh, and I think Brady has shockingly become a risky play. I'm 100% with you. 100% agree. And the Bills, Bobby, by the way, the Bills all season long have allowed one quarterback to, th- to score more than 18 fantasy points against them. Uh, they're just not very quarterback friendly. Only two quarterbacks have thrown more than one touchdown against them. So they're allowing more on the run, 14 rushing touchdowns in the last seven games. I, I'm, I'm with Justin. This goes back to Deion Lewis. I, 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 Brady in a tournament, yeah, that's fine because they're at home. Uh, it, I mean, Brady did struggle against them the last time they played 258 yards didn't throw a single touchdown against them back in week 13 so there is a concern there but yeah in cash I don't think that you even need to visit that I totally agree with you guys like I wasn't bringing up Tom Brady because I was thinking about playing him I was bringing him up because he's third in our projected ownership I think that 10% of people are going to probably play Tom Brady this week Uh, just because you know you look at his consensus projections across all the sites he's projected for 21 fantasy points and when you get something like that they're usually at least 10% and that's about what Brady's going to be Uh, maybe some recency bias because of his struggles but you know besides Newton and Wilson there's a few plays I like, but nowhere near the same level as Newton and Wilson. So uh, let's talk about some of those guys that maybe you should consider. Uh, Matthew Stafford at Cincinnati. Is there anyone else even on your radar, Justin, or is it just Newton and Wilson? Uh, you know, one other guy that I would consider um, might be Blake Bortles. It sounds crazy to use him in cash, but he's actually projected for decently high ownership. And the Jaguars running game has just been kind of a mess. And they are letting Blake Bortles run the offense, and he's actually doing a pretty good job. He's thrown for almost 300 yards in his last three starts. Um, San Francisco's pass defense is pretty bad. And uh, I think Bortles has actually got a decent floor uh, with that defense probably putting putting him in some great spots to score easy touchdowns. I really like Bortles. You know, he runs the ball, too. He he could get a rushing touchdown. He could get you 20, 60 rushing yards. Um, Here's my thing with Bortles. Like, if you have a chance at Wilson or Cam Newton, why would you even think about Bortles? But I wouldn't, I would say Newton and Wilson honest, weren't on the board. <laughs> yeah. 
let's say Newton and Wilson weren't on the board, like, yeah, Bortles would be in my top two or three guys, I would decide. And uh, I'm not even going to feel that upset about it. Like in the past, Tags has brought up Bortles two times in cash games. And I was like, there is no way I would even think about that. At this point, it's like, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, he's a cash game play now. Right. Yeah, and there's a lot of reasons to love him against San Fran. San Fran, by the way, nobody seems to realize how good San Francisco's run defense has gotten recently. Uh, they haven't allowed a rushing touchdown since week eight. So even if Leonard Fournette does play, even if he does play and if he gets 15 carries, he's not a guarantee to score. And unless you think the Jags are going to get shut out, then you're playing Blake Bortles. If you go back since week five, there's only been one quarterback to throw less than two touchdowns against the 49ers. And that was Mitch Trubisky, who threw the ball 15 times. So he still threw a touchdown on those 15 attempts. So, yeah, Blake Bortles comes with a super high floor. I have no issue with him. But the problem is, is that he's only 500 away from from Russell Wilson. He's only 300 away from Cam, which, uh, Justin, you hit on that. There's no reason to go down to Blake Bortles. But if you wanted to, it's not like the worst thing if you're trying to save a couple hundred bucks. The one other guy I'll mention before we move on over to running back is Jameis Winston. Uh, Tags, I know no, you're, this is making no, you upset because no. we got in a we got in a fight about it in the last show. I've been hyping him up all week. Like I look at his game log. Okay, he had the one game. I looked it up. Tags. Okay, sustained 20 mile per hour wins with gusts of 40 miles per hour. So yeah, duh, he struggled against Carolina. <laughs> Anybody would have. Okay, but besides that, tell him that, 18 James points, is not a good 26, play. 18, 26, 20, 18, 25. That's a great floor. Carolina's been playing bad football lately in the secondary. I have no problem with Jameis Winston, of course. I'm starting Cam Newton, so Winston's not there. But, you know, if we're going to talk about guys you should consider, Jameis Winston's fine in cash games again. Mm Mm-mm. Justin, please tell him. You said this last week, too, and he put up 25 points again, Tags. No, 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 I didn't. He was in the primetime slate last week, so I didn't say that. So, Justin. You said it it in the start sit show. I'm not talking about DFS. Oh, Newton, okay. Okay. Newton could just have easily got negative one points on a play that he got about six when he just heaved the ball up in the end, to the end zone in double coverage and Mike Evans went up and caught it over the other two guys. And in years past, you'd say, well, that's good offense. Mike Evans does that all the time. That's like <laughs> the first time Mike Evans has ever done that this year. So I'm not counting on Winston getting that again. Um, and I would be, I would be really scared to play Winston. He's the kind of guy who I feel like could get me like four points. Yeah. I mean, we, we've seen it before. He's uh, completely melted down in some games, but the only times it's happened this year was one in 20 plus mile per hour wins. And when he got hurt, so, um, I'm going to keep riding that train. I'm not doing it in cash games this week, but I'm telling you, if you need a cheaper guy, that's who I would consider, uh, guys, let's move on over to running back now. And there's a lot of plays I like. Justin, I'll let you start first, though. You mentioned Deion Lewis. Is he your number one running back to target in cash games this week? I don't know if he's number one. For the price, I really like where he falls into a lot of my lineups. Um, But I think that the top running back overall has got to be Zeke Elliott. Uh, On DraftKings, he's the fifth most expensive player. Seattle has just been getting gashed by the run. And even with Elliott out, Dallas is still top three in rushing attempts, rushing yards, um, like blocking efficiency, pretty much everything that you could measure about a run game, Dallas is still top three without Elliott. So with Elliott coming back, fully rested and apparently in great shape still, even though he refuses to talk about it, um, but he, uh, by all measures, they're going to run him all the way. Uh, if you look at before he went out, He was getting over 26 carries a game for his last four games before his suspension started. Uh, We expect him to get over 25 carries against Seattle and and just destroy them. Yep. Here's my thing with Zeke. I put him in my lineup at first, but now I'm looking at this. Tyron Smith has a strained LCL. Like, what is this offensive line without the best offensive lineman in football? I think there might be two or three safer options than Zeke. Like, I love the idea of him coming back and getting 25 plus carries, going for 150. Like, I could definitely see that playing out. But without Tyron, it scares me a little bit. Do we know if Tyron's not going to play, though? He's questionable. Like, if he's questionable, he either doesn't play or he's not 100% with a strained LCL, right? That dude is a freak. Tyron Smith is like a monster. Like, if you're going against that dude, you just like, seriously, you don't sleep well that night. Um, He's so good. But Zeke, the thing is, the thing about Zeke that's different than Alfred Morris that, that we have to bake into it is Zeke is used in the passing game. He had so many more receptions than he did in his rookie year. They were using him there. They needed him to use him there. And that's part of the reason I think we saw Dak Prescott struggle a little bit because he didn't have that three down presence that was on the field because Zeke kind of became that, that safety valve for him and he kept going to him. And I, that's what I'm saying. And on a site like DraftKings, that's PPR. 
a, a running back who's getting 25 touches against the Seattle defense, I will, I'll take him all day long. I still think that even without Tyron Smith, I would compare the Cowboys offensive line as talented as the Rams. And we saw what Todd Gurley did last week. So at this point in the season, teams are so worn down. The Seahawks team, they're beaten. They are bruised. They've lost Cam Chancellor. They're their number one run stopper. That's at the safety position. Losing all those guys and playing all these games they have, Ezekiel Elliott is coming in fresh. Like when you have a player this late in the season that's in a, as elite as a Ezekiel Elliott, who hasn't touched a football in six weeks, who's been in a great shape. And if you've seen pictures, Ezekiel Elliott has lost weight since he left the field. Does Brian said it makes his head look bigger. Uh, he was joking about it, but <laughs> Zeke looks he looks fantastic. Uh, I love Zeke. Honestly, at, at 8,000, I think he comes with zero risk. The one player that I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, Justin, is Alvin Kamara. I think that this matchup is tailor made for him. And I say that because like if we go back to the the matchup two weeks ago when they were playing uh, the Falcons, he caught I think I think he touched the ball four times in like the first couple minutes and then he got that concussion. Right. The Falcons have allowed uh, 94 receptions to running backs in the season, which is by far the most in the NFL. I think this matchup is tailor-made for him. Uh, do you think Kamara is someone that you'd use in cash? Yeah, we really like Kamara. Um, I mean, the Falcons are a perfect matchup for him. Like you said, they cannot defend running backs who catch passes as well, especially quick, shifty ones like Kamara. He could have an enormous game. Uh, I've been avoiding Kamara the last few weeks just because I feel like at some point this guy has to regress, right? But then he never really does. So uh, at this point, I, I really like him. Um, he's not even the most expensive back on the board. He's getting a little bit more work um, than than he was earlier in the year. Um, so I really do like him a lot in this matchup. One more point I wanted to go back on Zeke real quick. Um, if Tyron Smith is out, I would expect Byron Bell to get most of his snaps. That's what happened in week 11 when Smith was out. And Bell is actually a really good run blocker. His run block ratings are almost the same as Tyron Smith. It's pass blocking where he's just awful. So that actually might even lead to more Zeke carries. So if Smith is out, I think people could be off of Zeke, but it could actually end up helping him a little bit if the Cowboys decide to just lean on the run. You know, I'm looking at Kamara, and you look at his carries, I'm sorry, his touches the last five weeks, right? 14, 11, 14, 4 because he was injured. And then 19 last week, I'm sorry, not 19, he had 18 last week. There's a good chance that Zeke is going to have twice as many touches as him. And I know this sounds a little silly, but honestly, at this point in the season, who would you rather go up against? Atlanta or Seattle? I know most people are thinking like, Seattle was a top five defense. They lose a couple players. You know, everyone's playing hurt. And what are they now, like 10, 11? I don't know if they're a top 20 defense at this point. I think you can say Atlanta's a top 20 defense. So I'm taking Zeke with twice as many touches. I'm still not, I'm not messing with Kamara in cash games. Like I understand it's, it's been working for people, but it's not going to work forever when you get 12 to 15 touches. So real quick, Justin, so we talked about this in the show before. It was a past week, and I said that I loved Christian McCaffrey against Atlanta, and he goes off, he scores 20 uh, DK points against them. There have been four running backs to finish top 10 in PPR formats against them this year, Atlanta. <laughs> Tariq Cohen, Ty Montgomery, Christian McCaffrey, and James White. Who better fits that mold, Mark Ingram or Alvin Kamara? And that's what I'm saying. It's like when you talk about this matchup, it is legitimately tailor-made for Alvin Kamara to just go bonkers. In going back to that game that they played a couple weeks ago, again, he had four touches in like the first three minutes of that game before getting concussed. So they were well on their way to using him. And Atlanta really still hasn't seen Alvin Kamara. Yeah, I absolutely love Kamara. And if I was going to play a Saints running back, totally using Kamara over Ingram. And his ownership projections aren't even that high. I know uh, as the show started, we were talking about how there's four games missing from the slate with two on Saturday and two on Monday. But the ownership is still projected to be very spread out. Uh, There's no elite players that are just total chalk this week. I think Zeke is like one of the highest projected players and he's not even at 30%. Um, So, and if you look at, I think Kamara is about 10% and so is Ingram. If people are going to give me the same ownership and the same price, I'm totally using Kamara. We, we've got Kamara a little bit higher on our site, but, um, you know, he's just been a freak of nature all season. And, you know, for cash games, it's going to be a little bit lower because of who he is. Now, two players that a fair amount of people are, are going to use in their lineups, I don't think you should even consider it in cash games. Todd Gurley at Tennessee, Kareem Hunt in any cash game, in any lineup, right? I mean, Tags, would you even touch, would you even think about playing these guys when there's, 
you know, five to 10 other safer plays on the slate? I would consider Kareem Hunt. Um, He's just too expensive. I mean, that's the thing is I think Zeke's a better play. I don't think Kareem Hunt's a bad play and they're at home. They're a heavy favorite against a Miami team that they don't play very well on the road. So they're a heavy favorite. That's what you look for in cash game running backs. You want a home heavy favorite. That's exactly what he is. He obviously has been catching more passes. He play, he's played really well the last two weeks. I can't take that away from him, but I just feel like there's safer plays. I'd rather play Kamara and um, and Ezekiel Elliott, and you're, there's no way that you're fitting all three of them into a lineup. So yeah, and I get them cheaper. What do you think, Justin? My guy is Melvin Gordon. Would you rather play Melvin Gordon over uh, Gurley or Hunt? Totally. And I actually Hunt for me. I wrote a huge thing in the DFI War Room about Hunt. He is a complete fade for me. I wouldn't even play him in a GPP lineup, um, and specifically. Uh, he has dominated in his two matchups against the Chargers this year because the Chargers' one weakness in their running game is when teams run the ball to the right, and that is the Chiefs' strength. The Chiefs ran the ball 17 of, 13 out of 17 times to the right side of the line the first time they played the Chargers, and then they ran it to the right 14 more times um, in that Thanksgiving, or the last game against the Chargers. And so I wasn't surprised Hunt did well in both of those matchups. We were all over him in those. The Dolphins are really good against runs to the right, and Dominic and Sue shuts them down, and uh, they teams only have success running to the left, where the Chiefs do not run it well at all. And the Chiefs have also shown a, a willingness to attack teams where they're weak, and they've really been doing a good job of pounding exactly where the weakness is in the defense, which is great for DFS because it's one of the only teams with any predictability lately. Uh, and so we're against Kareem Hunt this week. I think you'll see his touches come down a little bit, even though they're big favorites. Yeah, and Gordon has 20 plus touches in five straight weeks. Uh, same with LaShawn McCoy. No way I'm playing him in cash games ever. He's just been too inconsistent yeah. all season. He's had four total busts. So those are the top running backs uh, in terms of cash and everything like that. But now we get into the mid tier range. And Justin, you mentioned Deion Lewis. You got to love him. Devontae Freeman. Uh, Kenyon Drake is just awesome. Uh, And then Leonard Fournette, as Tags mentioned, I'm not playing him either. Is there anyone else in this range that you guys like? Tags, I'll let you go first here. Yeah, I'm not a huge... I think Drake is a little overpriced this week against KC. That's that's a really tough place to play at Kansas City. Damian Williams is reportedly practicing. He might come back. I just don't think you need to go Drake. Like, going last week, he was like, what, 5,800? Like, he was a gimme. Like, he was an easy play. I think that's like Devonta Freeman. Devonta Freeman, the last three times he's played the Saints, he's totaled at least 85 yards rushing. Um, He's playing really well. They have Tevin Coleman, who I think is supposed to return from his concussion we don't know because Devonta Freeman on the Falcons he obviously missed a couple weeks with his concussion so we don't know where that is so I think Devonta at 65 is really cheap uh, another player that I would consider is Joe Mixon uh, at 5100 against Detroit Detroit's run defense ever since losing Haloti Nada we talked about in the start sit episode yesterday um, they've just been brutal against the run they can't stop it and Joe Mixon re- return to practice he had a full practice but he hasn't been officially cleared but seeing that it's Thursday I, I see no reason that he's not going to be playing Sunday so at 5100 returning from a concussion is not the same as returning from another injury so I think he takes that lead role right back it's you know 15 touches in that game and returns value at 5100 yeah I I like Mixon okay Freeman for me was going to be a DFI must have if Coleman was out Um, but Coleman cleared concussion protocol uh, earlier today so now I'm worried that he's he's definitely going to play and and take his role back so Freeman is still a decent option at uh, 6500 but he's, he's far from a lock, uh, which he would have been, in my opinion, if Coleman were to be out. If I'm taking a running back in the mid-range, I just don't really see how I don't end up with Deion Lewis. I, we have mm-hmm. a, One of our must-haves this week is Elijah Penny at 3,000. I think he's a Love fantastic it. play. And w- with Penny, you can pretty much get either Deion Lewis or somebody more expensive. So there's really nobody between Penny and Lewis that I'm considering for cash games. Why do you say Penny? I'm, I'm curious about this. So Kerwin Williams, Williams is banged up, man. Yeah, he still hasn't practiced. And uh, all reports we're seeing are said that he's pretty much doubtful to play. Um, and the Cardinals' run offense is actually good now. They only ran the ball for 100 yards twice in their first 10 games. And then somehow by losing David Johnson, Chris Johnson, and Adrian Peterson, they've now rushed for more than 100 yards in four games in a row. And Elijah Penny was clearly the workhorse back after Williams got hurt last week. He took over in the fourth quarter and pretty much played every snap. So if he's going to be the guy for a run, a run offense that's been pretty good and he only costs 3000 I mean, he has to do so little to return value. And he frees up 
the opportunity to get a lot of expensive players. I'd bet on 18 plus touches against the Giants, which at $3,000, yes, you have to say yes. Yeah. Are we concerned yeah. that Penny's not using the, are we, are we concerned though that Penny's not using the passing game very much? Uh, not really, because even if he gets 15 carries against the Giants, uh, I think that's good enough for 3,000, even if he, I mean, he only played a few snaps last week, just the fourth quarter. He got one target. Uh, he got one target the game before that on about eight snaps. So if he gets two or three targets and 15 carries, I, I'm very satisfied with that workload. Yeah, 3,000, that's Me not too. bad. Yeah, Deion Lewis is a really great play. The other guy in this is price range that really intrigues me, I've got him in my lineup right now, but it might be too risky. C.J. Anderson has torched me twice this season. He's getting <laughs> so many carries right now, though. Yeah, I don't I don't know what to make with the Broncos offense anymore. I, I haven't played a Broncos offensive player in a cash game in so long, and I don't think this will be the week that I try my luck on C.J. Anderson. I believe in the Redskins' defense uh, enough to not, not go down that road. Indiana's Indianapolis' uh, run D is absolutely horrible. I'm not surprised the Broncos just gave him 30 carries to just grind out that game. I don't think that they'll be killing the Redskins the way that they were up on Indianapolis. Um, and, and he's not involved enough in the passing game. He he was on the field pretty much the whole game last time, and he didn't catch a single ball. So that that scares me a bit, and his price went up quite a bit. Well, plus there's the fact that like you can get 30 carries all you want, but if your offense isn't going to score any touchdowns, it does not matter. Right. I want to bring up one more player that I really have considered, and it's weird because he doesn't catch passes, and we just talked about that with Elijah Penny. Jonathan Stewart. He's uh, 3,700 on DraftKings, and going against the Bucs, the Bucs have allowed 14 rushing touchdowns to running backs, one to quarterback. So, like, we've seen, like, I don't think people realize that Jonathan Stewart ranks uh, in the top 15 for carries in the NFL. So, he's getting carries every single week. The Bucs are going to be without Gerald McCoy, it seems like, again. They're just a bad defense at this point. So, why is Jonathan Stewart, should we consider him in cash at 3,700? I'm fine with that. I just think there's better plays. He's on my radar. He's someone I thought about, but he's like number seven, number eight. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. I agree with Bobby because at at that price range, you might as well just go get Elijah Penny. And then I don't think you need two minimum salary running backs on this slate. Well, that's the thing is like you. So you would rather have Penny than Stewart? Like, and it's only three. It's only 700 more. It's not like it's a a crazy discount where you're going 4,500 to three. I just think that Stewart would be the one that would have better shot at scoring like multiple touchdowns. If Penny was $1,500 more, I'd still use him over Stewart this week. I have to agree with Bobby there because if uh, if Stewart doesn't score, he could really kill you. But I think Penny will be involved enough that he'll return value without scoring a touch. I mean, the Cardinals haven't scored a touchdown in two weeks. So I'm obviously not picking Penny banking on touchdowns uh, when the, the team itself doesn't score at all. So... I think Penny will get enough with his yardage and receptions, any that he gets, um, to to make up for the fact that he probably won't score. And if Stewart doesn't score, then he could really kill you in cash games. I was saying we should have a side bet on this one, Bobby. You and I, but like for next week's show, we'll have to read. We'll have to revisit this one because I'll take Stewart. All right, Tags, let's turn this into a bet then, man. All right, we'll go back to the Twitter avatar. If Elijah Penny has a better PPR week than Jonathan Stewart then you have to put Edward from Twilight as your avatar picture for a week. If you win, I'll put Jacob. Uh, no, I don't care about the Twilight thing. I want you to change your name to Bobby. B-O-B-B-I. <laughs> well, okay, well, what happens if I win? Because I'm going to win, so well, we you, need to you figure pick out the Twitter what, what thing. The you pick the, the Twitter better. picture. I'll change my picture to Edward. That's fine. Um, but all I right, want to see Bobby right. with an eye. Well, I don't know. Like, where do I put that? Do I? Can I change my Twitter yeah. name? I don't think I have a Twitter name. Yeah, you do. It pops up every time. So it shows your name and then it shows your at, like your handle. So it'll show up as, as uh, Bobby with an eye, Sylvester. Oh, <laughs> yes, that sucks. But yeah, that. let's do it because I'm not going to lose. Right. I mean, Elijah, this is a give me for me. So like I should have picked something a lot better than, you know, some Twilight picture. But that's going to be embarrassing for you, man. This is going to be awesome. I can't wait. All right, let's do it. Uh, before we move on over to wide race. I want to take a moment to talk about the sponsor of today's show, TeamRankings.com. We had these guys on earlier in the season, and they did all kinds of pick'em contests, survivor contests, everything like that. Right now, college bowl season's going on. Team Rankings kills it with their college bowl stuff. If you're in a college bowl pick'em contest, I know a lot of the big ones are still coming up. So you can go check out TeamRankings.com. They offer data-driven picks for college bowl pick'em pools, plus spread picks, over-under picks, and a lot more. 
We may be the fantasy pros, but these guys are the office pool pros. And last year, their customers won college bowl pick em pools and confidence pools five times as often as expected. Picks for all bowl games are posted and available now. Go to teamrankings.com slash fantasy pros for exclusive discounts of up to 75% plus free offers on 2017 bowl picks. Again, that's teamrankings.com slash fantasy pros. All right, guys, let's go wide receiver here. And I'm all about Michael Thomas this week face Atlanta. He's just so consistent in cash games. He's been getting it done lately. I don't know why you wouldn't play him, right, Justin? Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely like Michael Thomas a lot. Um, I, there are other guys I would consider playing, but I guess in cash games, it's, it's pretty tough to go away from him, especially because he's pretty much yet to have the touchdown explosion game that will undoubtedly come once I don't pick him when he's chalked. <laughs> <laughs> Tags, do you like Thomas as your number one uh, spending up wide receiver? Is it Keenan Allen, Julio Jones, maybe? I know you're a Julio Jones guy. Yeah, I'm not playing Julio in cash against Marshawn Lattimore. Uh, I do. I yeah. think Julio is a fine tournament play, but uh, Keenan Allen's one that I really like. But my only concern is that the Chargers are traveling across the country and that that can often have like negative results. So that's obviously something you want to stay away from in cash. Michael Thomas obviously crushed the Falcons the last time they played, but that was also when Alvin Kamara left the lineup. So there's there's a little more risk. But at the same time, Michael Thomas has scored at least 13.9 DraftKings points in 11 of his 14 games like Last week we saw the uh, we saw Atlanta struggle against Mike Evans. Mike Evans finished with a line of uh, five catches for nine, uh, 79 yards and a touchdown. And on top of that, it should have been more than that because Mike Evans actually caught and they called him that that penalty. The announcers I, I, that's, that was like a pet peeve of mine. I was watching that game in live. I guess it looked like Mike Evans pushed off, but the defender had his arm on him and all he did was lift his arm to get it off. And they called it a push off. It should have been another touchdown, uh, but it wasn't. But Michael Thomas is a great play, but my favorite play in cash this week, and I don't know if like you guys are going to say I'm off my rocker here, but it's it's Doug Baldwin. I'm playing Doug Baldwin in every single one of my uh, – I'll, I'll have him in tournament lineups. I'll have him in cash lineups. I'm going to have him everywhere. Wow. He's um, against against the Cowboys. They uh, Xavier Woods has been their starting slot cornerback since uh, Orlando Skandrick has multiple fractures in his back. He's a, he's a rookie cornerback who's seen only 11 targets, and it's because of injury that he's on the field. They're saying that Skandrick might come back this week, but he's going to be playing with multiple back fractures. That's not something that's going to work against Doug Baldwin. If you look at Baldwin's game log this year, you could almost spot the the games that he should have crushed, and he did. He crushed against the Redskins. He scored 26.8 DraftKings points, 29.5 points against the Titans. This is another one of those matchups where, like I said, I love the Seahawks in this game, and Doug Baldwin is the second cheapest he's been all season. He's 6,300. So he comes with like minimal risk. I mean, he he obviously has a lower floor than we thought he did coming into the season, but his price has baked that into it. Like, wasn't wasn't I he lo- supposed to I crush him. last week? I didn't. I I did not actually have him crushing last week against the Rams. I, the, I didn't play Russell Wilson last week either. Like I actually started Ben Roethlisberger over him in one of my leagues because I I didn't like Russell Wilson against the Rams. He struggles against the Rams. I was talking about actually with our producer. Uh, he was mad because he's like Mike. What the hell's going on, with Russell Wilson? And I'm like, well, it's this matchup, and we both talked about in the fact that he struggles against the Rams like every single time, and it goes back to that whole division matchup thing, where it's just these division matchups. These teams know each other extremely well. That was the second time that Sean McVay had been playing the Seahawks offense, so obviously things should be getting better. This is a Dallas team. The game is indoors. You don't have to worry about the variables and the weather in late December that you do with some of these other players. There's just nothing that's going to scare me off of Doug Baldwin this week. Well, you know, plus Jeff Fisher treated Seattle like it was their Super Bowl. That was all they cared about. They didn't care about winning any games except Seattle. So the Rams are used to crushing Seattle. But that was, that was like Lovey Smith man. against the Packers. You, you are Mr. Hot Take here. Like, this is crazy to me. <laughs> you want to know about risk. Here's the risk. He finished wide receiver 37, wide receiver 50, oh, I know, I know wide the receiver numbers. 29, 51, 32, 27, 76, 102 last week. And you're going to start this guy in a cash game? I absolutely am, and I'm, I, I will not regret it either. You know what, Tags? I am also starting someone that you guys seem to think is a little risky in cash games. Uh, I do like Michael Thomas in cash games, but um, the DFI must have this week at wide receiver is Keenan Allen. And, and I know he's traveling across the country, um, but it's still the middle of the day. And so what often happens uh, in basketball with players traveling across the country is when they go from east to west, their body clock thinks that it's 10 o'clock, and then by halftime, their body clock thinks it's midnight. And so that messes with them um, because they get tired. When you're playing in the middle of the day, I have not found in my research any substantial issues 
uh, with players going west to east or east to west. So I'm not too worried about Allen in that. He got carted off the field last week, but it was a total precautionary measure. He mm-hmm. is completely fine, and he has completely led this offense. He's gotten 49 targets over just four weeks, um, and he's averaged about 30 fantasy points per week if you take out the game that he got injured. Uh, and DraftKings cut his price down by $700 just because their algorithm saw he had a bad week because he got hurt. Um, so with the price being lowered and having a great matchup, I, I, I don't think Buster Scrying can cover him in the slot. And the areas on the field that Allen really dominates is short middle and deep right. Uh, that's where he most of his successful routes go. And the Jets really struggled to cover those exact areas on the field. So we are locked in on Keenan Allen. He's got 22 red zone targets this year. There's just there's so many things to like about him, and we're only seeing him projected for about 10 to 12 percent ownership. Uh, so great GPP play as well. Can anyone cover this man? No, Bobby. I'm. I actually. Before we go any further, I want to say that I do love Keenan Allen. In my primer that I wrote this week, I okay. said that he's a, he's a must play. Like if you look, so he's actually been playing outside of the slot more often recently. He's been playing like fifty percent of his snaps on the yeah. perimeter, which is really good as well because Morris Claiborne is covering number one receivers in the outside. And if they stick Morris Claiborne on him, bad things are going to happen for Morris Claiborne because ever since they came back from the bye, Morris Claiborne has been playing kind of gimpy, and it's shown. De- Devin Funches seven catches, one hundred eight yards. Yards. Tyreek Hill, six catches, 185 yards, two touchdowns. Demarius Thomas, 93 yards and a touchdown. Michael Thomas, 93 yards and a touchdown. He's been burned consistently ever since the that bye week came. So whether it's Buster Screen, whether it's uh, Claiborne, doesn't matter. I love Keenan Allen here. I, like I said, the only thing that I don't like about him is the fact that they're traveling. But again, it, it's it's a dream matchup. And if they're if we take the the variable away from that matchup, then I I actually agree with you that Keenan Allen's a better play than Michael Thomas. I'm playing Michael Thomas and Keenan Allen for sure. Like you look at what he's been doing. If he stayed healthy last week, he was going to get 100 yards for the fifth straight week. I'm convinced if he played Jacksonville tomorrow that he would get 100 yards. He's just crazy right now. I know that they shut him down in week 10, but he's just been nuts lately. So (laughs) I'm playing Keenan Allen until this slows down even a little bit. Yeah, he's been so good. Let's talk some cheaper wide receivers because if you want to pay up for those guys, that's fine. Me, I want to pay up at running back, so I'm going to need to find some cheaper wide receivers. I think Keelan Cole at 4,700 is like a gimme uh, against San Fran. He's going to play on the perimeter more, which which, you know, we talked about a little bit, but knowing that San Francisco has stepped up against the run, knowing that we like Blake Bortles, why not get his, you know, number one, number two receiver at 4,700? I still think that D.D. Westbrook is the best receiver on that team this week, but he's also 6,100, so you're paying a lot more for him. I'd rather take the discount on Cole. I've got a I've got a mid-price receiver that I really like, and he was actually one of our must-haves last week, completely let us down, let the whole industry down. A lot of people played him. D.D. Westbrook. And there is good reason to go back to Westbrook, in my opinion. He excels on the outside parts of the field, left sideline and right sideline. And the 49ers are actually the third best team defending passes over the middle of the field. But they're bottom three in the league on left side, left sideline and right sideline, which leads to an overall pass rating of just being horrible in pass coverage overall. Um, but it's even worse than it looks when you consider just the outside receivers. And so I don't expect uh, Westbrook to be ignored like he was last week. Keelan Cole pretty much ran the same route. Did either of you guys watch that game uh, or watch the film yet on that Jaguars game? Cole basically ran the same crossing route on every play and was just wide open over and over and over again. (laughs) It was absurd. And it was so aggravating to watch because there were plays where Westbrook was open too. But I was like, shoot, if I'm Blake Bortles, I'm just ignoring him and throwing it to Keelan Cole again because it's the easiest route. And I think that's why Clowney said Bortles is trash. He didn't have to do anything. Like, he had the underneath underneath crossing route open on every play. How hard is that to just pitch and catch to that guy? So uh, I understand. Why didn't uh, Clowney just step back and pick off a pass then? You would think that he would. Not you, (laughs) you. Clowney is such a dork, losing like 40 points twice and calling someone a bum. Yeah, that was stupid. And and apparently Jaguars fans are literally mailing trash cans to his house. (laughs) I don't know where people, just quick tangent, 
Where do people get the addresses of these flyers? I have no idea. Like, if I wanted to just mail someone trash, I wouldn't know how to go about that. It's amazing that these fans are that dedicated. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to get too too detracted. I, I don't think that uh, that that crossing route that Cole runs on every play will be open against the Niners. I think Westbrook will be far more involved this week. Um, it, it seems like a risky cash play because it feels like his floor is so low. But another problem with last week for him that ruined the matchup that we love was that Marquise Lee got hurt right away, and then Jonathan Joseph shifted over to cover Westbrook. And Bortles has actually done a really good job of avoiding the worst cornerback matchup this year. So he just completely ignored D.D. Westbrook for the rest of the game, and once Jonathan Joseph was on him. So a lot of factors went into Westbrook being ignored, none of which were really his fault or cause for concern going forward. So I really like Westbrook this week in cash and GVP. I think you've got to play one of these guys. Like you could even get away with playing both in cash games if you need to save the money. Because like we talked about, Bortles is a safe play against San Francisco. And these are the two guys like Jaden Mickens. I'm sorry. He's not scoring two touchdowns again. He was on special teams the entire season. They're using him out of necessity. And he's hardly even a wide receiver. So it's these two guys all over again. And if Bortles gets 250 yards and two touchdowns, it's mostly going to these guys. So real quick, Justin, is I think Alan Hearns is supposed to return this week. And if he returns, he's going to go into the slot and that's going to kick Keelan Cole back outside. Would that bump Keelan Cole in your projections to where you'd like him just as much, if not more than D.D. Westbrook because he's cheaper? I wouldn't like him more because if still, if you look at where they're doing their damage this year, um, Westbrook has not caught a ball more than 10 yards down the field over the middle of the field all year. Uh, and he's caught at least four passes of 20 air yards or more down the field along the sidelines. And then Keelan Cole is the exact opposite. He doesn't catch anything outside. He's done all of his damage over the middle of the field. So if he does run routes on the outside, he's yet to show me anything substantial. He's caught one ball deep right this year. He dropped one. um, and, And most of his work has been right over the middle of the field. So it still concerns me, even if he does get pushed outside, I probably won't be playing him because I think a lot of recency bias will have people all over him when they when they probably have no idea what I'm talking about right now. Yeah, I definitely, I understand what you're talking about. So that's why I, I appreciate the input. So yeah. is there any other wide receivers that we want to talk about? I mean, we haven't really talked about many, but like those are the three guys I'm using. What, what else am I going to say? Like, hey, I think you should use my ninth guy. It's Michael Thomas, Keenan Allen, and Didi Westbrook for me. All right. All right, that's fair. All right, so we hit on those. Let's talk about some tight ends real quick before we get into our tournament plays. Um, if you're paying up, I think I think Kelsey's the one I pay up for this week. Miami struggles with tight ends, um, but I don't think I'm going to have him in any cash lineups just because it's just so tight this week. I, I'm going down to Cameron Brate. And yes. Honestly, it's kind of an insane, and you guys will see it uh, on Saturday morning. My cash article comes out uh, with my cash game plays, and Cameron Brate's in there, and I have a chart in there that highlights when Jameis Winston is playing, uh, basically excluding weeks 9 through 12, Cameron Brate and O.J. Howard combined for ridiculous amounts of points. Like There was there was just one game this year where they had less than 14 PPR points combined between the two. Um and that was back in week two. So the the relationship here is fantastic. OJ Howard is now on IR. So Cameron Bray kind of gets everything there. Deshaun Jackson's still not practicing. So we don't know if he's going to play. Cameron Braid at 3,300 is a legitimate steal. Carolina Panthers are going to be missing Thomas Davis in defense. He's one of their, their best linebackers they have. Uh, so I think Breit is the one that I'm having all my cash games. And honestly, I'm not really considering anybody else. Tags, you talked to me into Cameron Braid in the start sit show. Like big time changed my mind. And uh, again, l- like you said, there is nobody else I am even considering with how cheap Cameron Braid is. Like you look at his game log, okay? In weeks one through eight, he was awesome. Like, uh, okay, they, they were on the bye for week one. So weeks two through eight, he was number four in yards. Uh, he was number four in touchdowns behind Gronk, Travis Kelsey, Zach Ertz. And then OJ Howard took over all the snaps. OJ Howard's done now. So I have Cameron Bright right behind Gronk, Kelsey, Ertz, Greg Olson now that he's back, and Evan Ingram just because he's going to get so much, uh, so many targets again. But I've got him even ahead of Delaney Walker, who's super consistent, just because Cameron Bright's the only guy, and when he's been the only guy, Jameis Winston loves to throw the ball to him. Yeah, Justin, is, is like, are we crazy here? No, um, no, like, you're the thing on. is, is like, I'm seeing that. Yeah, I'm seeing the projected ownership is like really, really low this week. They're like projecting like one to two percent, which is just crazy. On who? Um, on, on Cameron Bright. Oh, I'm not seeing that. We've got him at six percent on our site tags. 
Really? Nice. Well, that's still low. Yeah. I'm seeing yeah, I'm is. seeing 15% on some sites. I'm seeing as much as 20% on others. I would be shocked if he's below 25 to 30% in high stakes. Uh, usually you see the high stakes guys all over these sharp value plays, and Braid is as sharp as they come for a value play. Like you said, he's practically an elite tight end. If, if I'm going just total optimal plays, regardless of price, in a vacuum, who's going to be get the most points? I think Braid finds himself around number five, maybe six. So... For that price, a uh, complete lock in cash games. Yeah. Good deal. Uh, is there anyone else you're considering? Like, if you have to spend up, you're going Gronk, Kelsey, Greg Olson, Evan Ingram, Delaney Walker, who's If I consistent? spend up, I'm going with Kelsey because the Chiefs have really shown me that they are attacking teams the right way. And like we talked about, Miami can't cover tight ends. So if they're going to con- stay consistent with their approach of attacking teams where they're weak, Travis Kelsey will be used and Kelsey has had terrible luck I don't know if you've watched his last couple games but he could easily have like four more touchdowns than he has yeah so and part of that is his fault I mean he's he's all of a sudden developed a pair of stone hands lately but I, I still think Kelsey is as good as any tight end in the league and he's so involved in that offense even in bad matchups that they should really use him a lot in a good one and I, the, the, the matchup that comes to mind is against Denver where everyone said, how much will they use him? Uh, Denver is a great tight end matchup, but really bad for receivers. Well, they use Kelsey a ton, and he ended up with 29 fantasy points on 133 yards. So I look to them. I look for uh, Kelsey to be really involved again. Well, and Bobby, before we before we get the defenses real quick, I do want to mention if people out there are struggling because I did this for a while when I first started playing DFS. If you're struggling to say, how can I spend 6,900 on a tight end? Think of it this way. Travis Kelsey, as of right now, in PPR points, ranks 10th among wide receivers, right in front of Julio Jones. And if Julio Jones had a matchup against one of the worst defenses against the the wide receiver position, you'd be playing him at $6,900. So the question is, can you find the value elsewhere? But it's always good to put it in perspective because some people will think, oh, tight end for $6,900? No way. But when someone like Travis Kelsey is producing the way that he is in such a good matchup, he can be worth it if you want to go a different route instead of cheap. But it's just, it's so hard to go away from Braid for me this week. All right, guys, defense, special teams. And, uh, you know, there's actually quite a few to decide between this week. Jacksonville at San Francisco, but they're stupid expensive. Uh, The Chargers against Bryce Petty, that's a great play. Play. My pick, though, is Chicago Bears against Cleveland. I think I pick on Deshaun Kaiser every week, and it works every week, so why not? <laughs> <laughs> Who do you like, Justin? Uh, well, the Jaguars have to be my favorite. I know Garoppolo is playing a lot better, but the Jags D is just something else. Um, but, but if I do go down from them, I'm interested in the Lions at Cincinnati, and I'm interested in the Panthers. I hate to pick on Jameis Winston, uh, but I, I don't think the Tampa Bay offense is very good, and uh, I would like to roll with the Panthers D getting a lot of pressure on Winston and uh, possibly forcing some turnovers, maybe a pick six. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I think the chargers, the bears, uh, the Panthers, those are ones I'm considering. I also think the chiefs could be sneaky good at 3,300. They, they play really good defense at home. Like people kind of arrowheads, like one of the toughest places to play, which is why I'm not, hu- I'm a huge, I'm not a huge fan of Kenyon Drake this week, just because it's rare for a team to go in there and score multiple touchdowns. So, right. um, I'm down on that entire offense, which means I have to like the Kansas city defense. Fair. Well, you're not joking. Look at these home games, 12 fantasy points, 12, seven against Pittsburgh, of course, 21, uh, six against Buffalo, 13, 14. They're getting it done. Yeah, for sure. And that's what I'm saying. They're just a different defense at home. Like, I don't know what it is about Kansas City, but that that place is, it's like, you know, when people talk about going into Seattle, I think Kansas City is like the worst place to play for opponents. Yeah. All right, guys, well, we're going to go GPP in just a second. But first, I want to ask you all about stacks. Tags, is there a stack that you really like? Um, honestly, if you want to go contrarian here, you can go Russell Wilson, Jimmy Graham. Nobody wants to play Jimmy Graham. Uh, people were shocked to hear that Austin Hooper has more yards than Jimmy Graham this year, but it's what happens, but he relies so much on touchdowns. So recency bias is going to bring his uh, ownership down. He, his price has dropped to 4,700. So if you want to go with a stack, Jimmy Graham there, if not there, Totally contrarian. You can go Matt Ryan to Mohamed Sanu. That's that's a different one because uh, Sanu's matchup against New Orleans is really good, and that game has uh, shootout potential written all over it. What about you, Justin? Uh, so for me, it's it's the Alex Smith, Travis Kelsey, Tyree Kill, and potentially even Albert Wilson stack. I, I already uh, oh. spent a lot of time talking about why I don't like Kareem Hunt. Therefore, I really like Alex Smith. They're expected to put up 27 points. Uh, so I'm, I'm not saying they aren't going to put up that many points. I actually think they could go over. 
Uh, but I don't think it'll be all Kareem Hunt like a lot of people think. And Alex Smith projected about 2% ownership. I'm really excited to use him in GPPs this week. Nice. My uh, my GPP stack that I like is, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Jared Goff. Ooh, um, yep. Jared Goff with Todd Gurley, who's going to be active in the pass game. He's going to get, you know, 20 rushes again. So you get Jared Goff, you get Todd Gurley, which a lot of people aren't going to do. And then Robert Woods, because Robert Woods is their go-to guy. Maybe Sammy Watkins has a big game this week, but if I'm going bold already with uh, with Goff and Gurley, I'm just sticking Woods in there. He's the safest bet. I like Goff. I actually think he could be considered in cash at 6,100. Uh, Tennessee's run defense, 3.3 yards per carry. They've only allowed four rushing touchdowns. If Gurley's getting anything done, he's getting done through the air this week. Uh, Watkins is back. Uh, or Watkins, I shouldn't say Watkins is back. Watkins is still there. Uh, <laughs> um, Robert Woods is back, so that obviously helps. Yeah, that Tennessee secondary, man, they're not good. So I actually love the idea of playing Goff with someone. I think that Sammy Watkins at 4,400 is not a bad stack for a tournament. My GPP play of the week at defense special teams is the Washington Redskins face Brock Osweiler. Uh, as we know, with Denver's offense, it could be ugly. Justin, who's your GPP defense? Uh, I was actually going to go with the Panthers as my GPP defense. Uh, I already talked about them as a potential cash defense. I'm not, there's no one I'm really just punting at a uh, super low on defense. Uh, you know, sometimes though, it just comes down to it where you're like, all right, I have no room left in my roster. I'll just throw in this defense. Uh, and every now and then it happens, but nobody I'm planning on punting. Yeah, I I would have mentioned I th- I would have said Carolina. I think Denver is an interesting tournament option too. Um, oh, hurts they're, they're they're on the road in Washington, but Washington. Their offensive line is so bad right now. Like yeah. they're just allowing everybody. It's like it's like a turnstile. Everybody's just going through. If Denver Denver <laughs> has played better defense the last couple of weeks, so um, if if they've refound some sort of you know motive to play or whatever the case is, uh, Denver's defense could be interesting. Because I think if you were to go back to the beginning of the season and say uh, you're going to get Denver's defense against a Washington banged up offensive line, would you play them at 3,200? The answer would have been yes. Tags, you're going to love this at uh, at tight end. Adam Shaheen, man, he could score yeah, two buddy. touchdowns. Every every single week, some random dude scores two touchdowns. This week, it's going to be Adam Shaheen. If he plays, I think it's a realistic possibility. The Browns are so bad, man. They're, they're like legitimately bad. And Adam Shaheen, to his credit, he's looked really good when he's been given an opportunity. I just don't know if he's going to play. He's been practicing limited. I don't know if the Bears are waiting for him to get in a full practice before actually putting him out there. But I think that Ricky Seals-Jones belongs in that conversation, too. Um, against the Giants. I mean, we don't know his relationship with Drew Stanton, but um, Ricky Seals-Jones is a very athletic tight end. He's 3,500, and the, the Giants have been awful, man. Like, I think everybody knows that. No, I like Seals-Jones a lot. Up there. Yeah. Justin, when you go contrarian, like, how, when you play GPP lineups, how often do you go contrarian? Like, how many players in your lineup? Because I know you like to do, like, one really good GPP lineup and use them in all the contests instead of entering, like, 100 times. Yeah. That's worked out really well for you. So, like, how many contrarian plays do you usually use? Uh, I usually try to get like two to three guys because if you just go with one, then you're going to get a lot of people who also built around that one guy. Um, and even though even with 1%, that's still thousands of people in a big contest. But if you have two or three very low on guys, you're almost certainly totally differentiated from everybody else. Um, so that's usually my goal. And then I just don't really worry about ownership for the rest of my plays. Okay. All right, guys, let's go wide receiver here. And when we were talking about cash games, we only mentioned like five or six guys. There's just not that many good plays at wide receiver this week. So uh, who's on your GPP radar tags? Uh, Devin Funches is an awesome play. Yeah. Uh, 6,600. Yes. Um, yeah, the Bucks are, are really, really hurting at... Uh, We've we talked about this. Ryan Smith is playing right cornerback. So Ryan Smith is been has been awful. Um, he's allowing I think it's a 130 passer rating when targeted in coverage, and that's on like over 40 targets in coverage. So he's he's seeing plenty of targets. He's someone to pick on. Uh, Devin Funches is a massive massive man that. Cam Newton can kind of just throw the ball up to, even if he goes to the other side of the field and plays against Brent Grimes. Brent Grimes is five foot ten. Um, Devin Funch should have a big week. The recency bias should bring down his ownership a little bit. And I also think Mike Evans at 6,400 is a good play in a tournament. Um, Mike Evans looked better last week. And if Deshaun Jackson's out, like this run game isn't getting anything going against uh, against Carolina. So it's very possible that Mike Evans sees like 15 targets this game. Like that wouldn't shock me in the slightest with OJ Howard out with Deshaun Jackson, maybe out. Um, it could be one of those games. And Carolina, I mean, they haven't been great as of late. Uh, against the past. So I think Mike Evans could be a good tournament play. You know, I love Chris Hogan. Like, obviously, if he plays, he's got big upside. But my other play that I really love is Kendall Wright. I don't know why we didn't talk about him for cash games up against Cleveland, all the targets he's getting, how cheap he is. Kendall Wright's a good play in GPP and cash games. 
mm, there's a realistic possibility that the Bears throw the ball like 12 times. <laughs> Seriously, like that, that Jordan Howard's a good tournament play because of that. Why would they throw the ball 12 times when Cleveland stuffs the run, dude? They can't stop the pass whatsoever. Just throw the ball to Kendall Wright 15 times like you've been doing. Brian? Well, no, Cleveland's actually been, like, been giving up. They've been leaking on the run. Justin, like, have, have you, what do you have to say on this Barry yeah, offense? So like, do you think... I think Brian Bobby Calhoun is actually a pretty good slot corner, and uh, Kendall Wright's been solid. But when I watch the Bears games... Kendall Wright gets targeted when they are running two-minute offenses and four-minute offenses. When the defense is sagging back, that's when Wright's been doing all of his damage. So I don't see the Cleveland defense ever sagging back and prevent because I don't see them ever having a lead. So I wouldn't, I'm not wild about Kendall Wright for that reason. Who, who are some GPP plays in your mind? Uh, I mean, yeah, for a GPP play, he's interesting. I'm just not wild about him. But um, a guy that I like that, that costs a little more, so it's kind of tough to get, is uh, Jarvis Landry. He's had 90 yards, over 90 yards, three times this year, but never broken 100. So he's so close to getting you that bonus. He's had a multi-touchdown game this year. He's been getting in the end zone a lot more than usual. Uh, he's had games with, with double-digit receptions. So if he could put it all together, uh, I think they'll be trailing early and often. Chiefs D is tough, but I think when, the, when they're moving the ball quickly down the field trying to catch up, I think you could go into halftime being really disappointed that you played Jarvis Landry, and then at the end of the day, be like, wow, he actually did pretty well. So uh, he's a guy that I'm interested in. Yeah, for sure. Okay, we're going to running back now. Justin, who are some running backs you like for GPP? So I like going back to guys who did poorly the week before, because I feel like people just get so mad about it, and then they let their emotions just forget about that player. And Mike Davis is a guy for me that through no fault of his own, had a bad week last week and let a lot of people down including myself, Uh, but he's still the featured back in this offense. And even though it didn't look like it because uh, J.D. McKissick came in when they were down 34-0 and then finished the rest of the game, uh, I don't expect teams to be using their starting running back when they're down 34-0 in the second half. So I can't blame the Seahawks for benching Mike Davis in that situation. I don't think that has anything to do with how they feel about him coming into this week. And uh, the matchup with Dallas is a fine one, and Davis is only 4,500 on DraftKings and is the feature running back, albeit behind a weak offensive line, but uh, I think the uh, the upside is there for him. He's the one guy I was going to say, too. I mean, everyone we talked about in cash games, I think is applicable also for GPP. I think running back is pretty easy to navigate this week, but yeah, Mike Davis, you don't use him in cash games, but I'm all over him in GPP. Tags, what about you on Mike Davis, and uh, who are some of your other guys? I'm not a huge Mike Davis one, just because Seattle still just scored just one rushing touchdown the entire year, um, like with their running backs, and that was uh, J.D. McKissick back in like, I don't even know what week that was. That was like the first five weeks of the season. So they really just, it seems like they don't want to run. Sean Lee is back for the Cowboys. So obviously that, that lowers the ceiling a little bit for me. I would rather play Jordan Howard. Uh, He's someone else that struggled last week. He's 6,600. So you're, you're not paying a little bit, but Cleveland, you know, you mentioned it, but Cleveland as of late, man, ever like over the last six weeks, I think it's ever since they lost Jamie Collins at linebacker, they've been slowly trending downhill, allowing touchdowns to most running backs. So I think that Jordan Howard is someone that most people are just forgetting how explosive he can be because I remember there was a week it was a couple weeks ago where nobody wanted to play him because like well he doesn't catch passes so he's not really a tournament option he went off he scored two touchdowns he went over 100 yards like he was more than a tournament option so I think that you have that possibility in in Chicago late December it's just not going to favor the passing games that's a good call tags yeah I, I like the Jordan Howard pick and now closing at quarterback My favorite play is Dak Prescott. Like, do you guys remember when he started the season 17 fantasy points, 17, 22, 23, 30, 29? He was going crazy. Then all of a sudden, Zeke suspended. Uh, You know, people are getting hurt on the offensive line. Now that everything's a lot better, I'm wondering against Seattle. I mean, they just gave up like 80 billion points last week to the Rams. Maybe Dak has another one of those 25 plus point weeks. Yeah, that's an interesting pivot off of Elliott. I, I assume you'd be off of Elliot. Maybe you'd stack him with Elliot, but uh, with everybody yeah, off. with everybody so high on the ground game, that would be an interesting move to go with Dak because it's one of those things where you almost can't picture it happening, and then you watch the game and Dak throws for three touchdowns, and you're like, no, oh, of course that could happen. It's Seattle, so uh, yeah, that's an interesting play. Mine is of course Alex Smith. Um, I, we already I've already been talking him up a lot, so no need to go into it more. But uh, that's my GPP play that I hope everyone 
remembers from the show. Yeah, and I think Drew Brees will also be one of those guys that you could play in a tournament and be happy, and you could do a stack between him, Kamara, and Michael Thomas. I think you can get away with that against the Falcons, who've really been struggling as of late. Drew Brees has been showing you, reminding you that he's still the elite quarterback that he once was, just doesn't need to throw as many touchdowns as he used to. But in a home game against the Falcons, again, a game that's got shootout potential, I think uh, that Brees is probably one of the better tournament options. All right, guys. Well, that's all for today's show. Justin, we really appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. And for those of you at home, remember we've got the contest with DraftKings. It's fantasypros.com slash DraftKings. It's a $1 entry. You can win a lifetime subscription to Fantasy Pros and $1,000. Remember to also root for Elijah Penny. That's going to be a lot of fun when Tags has to put <laughs> a uh, a Twilight character as his avatar on Twitter. You can follow us at Bobby Fantasy Pro at Mike Tagliere NFL, and at Justin McMahon. And thank you also to the sponsor of today's show, TeamRankings.com. Go to TeamRankings.com slash FantasyPros for up to 75% off bull picks. For Mike Tagliere, I'm Bobby Sylvester. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your football. I just wanted you to watch me dissolve.